Section 11 of The Maker of Rainbows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Le Gallienne. Section 11 The Princess's Mirror. The sun was scarcely risen, but the young princess was already seated by her window. Never did window open upon a scene of such enchantment. Never has the dawn risen over so fair a land. Meadows so fresh and grass so green, rivers of such mystic silver and far mountains so majestically purple, no eye has seen outside of paradise, and over all was now outspread the fairy land of the morning sky. Even a princess might rise early to behold so magic a spectacle, yet strangely enough, it was not upon this miracle that the eyes of the princess were gazing. In fact, she seemed entirely oblivious of it all, oblivious of all that was passing in the sky and of all the dewy awakening of the earth. Her eyes were lost in a trance over what she deemed a rarer beauty, a stranger marvel. The princess was gazing at her own face in a golden mirror. Her only care was to gaze all day at her own face, and indeed it was a beautiful face that she saw there, so beautiful that the princess might well be pardoned for thinking it the most beautiful face in the world. So fascinated had she become by her own beauty that she carried her mirror ever at her girdle and gazed at it night and day. Whenever she saw another beautiful thing, she looked in her mirror and smiled to herself. She had looked at the most beautiful rose in the world and then she had looked in her mirror and said, I am more beautiful. She had looked at the morning star, and then she had looked in her mirror and said, I am more beautiful. She had looked at the rising moon, and then she had looked in her mirror, and still she said, I am more beautiful. Whenever she heard of a beautiful face in her kingdom, she caused it to be brought before her, and then she looked in her mirror, and always she smiled to herself and said, I am more beautiful. Thus it had come about that her only care was to gaze all day at her own face. So enamored had she become of it that she hated even to sleep. But not even in sleep did she lose the beautiful face she loved, for it was still there in the mirror of dreams. Yet often she would wake in the night to gaze at it, and always she arose at dawn that, with the first rays of the sun, she might look into her mirror. Thus, from the rising sun to the setting moon, she would sit at her window and never take her eyes from those beautiful eyes that looked back at her, and the longest day in the year was not long enough to return their gaze. This particular morning was a morning in May. All bloom and song and crowding leaves and thickening grass, the valley was a mist of blossom, and the air thrilled with the warbling of innumerable birds. Soft dewy scents floated hither and thither on the wandering breeze, but the princess took no note of these things. Lost in the dream of her face and saw the changes of the dawn only as they were reflected in her mirror and suffused her beauty with her rainbow tints. So wrapped in her dream was she that when a bird alighted near at hand and broke into a sudden song, she was so startled that the mirror slipped from her hand. Now the princess's window was in the wall of an old castle built high above the valley, and beneath it the ground sloped precipitately, covered with underbrush and thick grasses, to a high road winding far beneath. As the mirror slipped from the hand of the princess, it fell among this underbrush and rolled glittering down the slope, 
till the princess finally lost sight of it in a belt of wild flowers overhanging the high road. As it finally disappeared, she screamed so loudly that the ladies-in-waiting ran to her in alarm, and the servants were instantly sent forth to search for the lost mirror. It was a very beautiful mirror, the work of a goldsmith famous for his fantastic masterpieces in the precious metals. The fancy he had skillfully embodied was that of beauty as the candle attracting the moths. The handle of the mirror, which was of ivory, represented a candle, the golden flame of which swept around in a circle to hold the crystal. Wrought here and there on the golden back of the mirror were moths with wings of animal and precious stones. It was a marvel of the goldsmith's art, and as such was beyond price. Yet it was not merely for this, as we know, that the princess loved it but because it had been so long the intimate of her beauty. For this reason it had become sacred in her eyes, and as she watched it roll down the hillside, she realized that it had gained for her also superstitious value. It almost seemed as if to lose it would be to lose her beauty too. She ran to another mirror and panicked. No, her beauty still remained. But no other mirror could ever be to her like the mirror she had lost. So, forgetting her beauty for a moment, she wept and tore her hair and beat her tiring maids in her misery. And when the men returned from their searching without the mirror, she gave orders to have them soundly flogged for their failure. Meanwhile, the mirror rested peacefully among the wild flowers and the humming of bees. A short while after the serving men had been flogged and the tiring maids had been beaten, there came along the white road at the foot of the castle a tired minstrel. He was singing to himself out of the sadness of his heart. He was forty years old, and the exchange that life had given him for his dreams had not seemed to him a fair equivalent. He had even grown weary of his own songs. He sat, dejected, amid the green grasses, and looked up at the ancient heaven and thought to himself. Then suddenly he turned his tired eyes again to earth and saw the daisies growing there and the butterflies flitting from flower to flower, and the road as he looked at it seemed long, longer than ever. He took his old lute in his hand wondering to himself if they could play another tune. They were so in love with each other and so tired of each other. He played one of his old songs, of which he was heartily weary, and as he played, the butterflies fleeted about him and filled his old hair with blue wings. He was forty years old and very weary. He was alone. His last night angle had ceased singing. The time had come for him when one thinks, and even dreams, of the fireside, the hearth, and the beautiful old memories. He had, in short, arrived at that period of life when one begins to perceive the beauty of money. As a boy, he had never given a thought to gold or silver. A butterfly had seemed more valuable to him than a gold piece. But he was growing old, and, as I have said, he was beginning to perceive the beauty of money. The daisies were all around him, and the lark was singing up there in the sky, but how could he cash a daisy or negotiate a lark? Dreams, after all, were dreams, he was saying this to himself. When suddenly his eye fell upon the princess's mirror, lying there in the grass, so covered with butterflies looking at themselves that no wonder the serving man had been unable to find it. The mirror of the princess, as I have said, was made of gold and ivory and wonderful crystal and many precious stones. So when the minstrel took it in his hands out of the grass, he thought, well, that he might at least buy a breakfast at the next town, for he was very hungry. Well, 
he caught up the mirror and hid it in his faded doublet and took his way to a wood of living green and when he was alone that is alone with a few flowers and a bird or two and a million leaves and the soft singing of a little river hiding its music under many bows he took out the mirror from his doublet shame upon him he a poet of the rainbow had only one thought as he took up the mirror the gold and ivory and the precious stones he was merely thinking of them and his breakfast but when he looked into the mirror expecting to see his own ancient face what did he see he saw something so beautiful that just like the princess he dropped the mirror have you ever seen the wild rose as it opens its heart to the morning sky have you ever seen the hawthorn holding in its fragrant arms its innumerable blooms have you seen the rising of the moon or look into the face of the morning star the minstrel looked in the mirror and saw something far more wonderful than all these wonderful things. He saw the face of the princess, eternally reflected there, for her love of her own beautiful face had turned the mirror into a magic glass. To worship oneself is the only way to make a beautiful face. And as the minstrel looked into the mirror, he sadly realized that he could never bring himself to sell it and that he must go without his breakfast the moon had fallen into his hand out of the sky could he a poet exchange the celestial windfall for a meal in a new doublet as the minstrel gazed and gazed at the beautiful face he understood that he could no more sell the mirror than he could sell his own soul and in his pilgrimage through the world he had received many offers for his soul also many kings and captains had vainly tried to buy from him his gift of courage but the minstrel had sold neither and now had fallen out of the sky one more precious thing to guard the most beautiful face in the world so as he gazed in the mirror he forgot his hunger forgot his faded doublet forgot the long sorrow of his days and at length there came the setting sun suddenly the minstrel awoke from his dream at the sound of horsemen in the valley the princess was sending heralds into every corner of her dominions to proclaim the loss of the mirror and for its return a beautiful reward a lock of her strange hair the minstrel hid himself with his treasure amid the fern and when the trumpets had faded in the distance found the high road again and went upon his way now it chanced that a scullery maid of the castle as she was polishing a copper saucepan had lifted her eyes from her work and looking down toward the high road had seen the minstrel pick up the mirror he was a very well-known minstrel all the scullery maids and all the princesses had his songs by heart even the birds were fabled to sing his songs as they flitted to and fro on their airy business thus through the scullery maid it became known to the princess that the mirror had been found by the wandering minstrel and so his life became a life of peril bandits hoping for the reward of that lock of strange hair hunted him through the woodland across the marshes and over the moors jews with great money bags came to buy from him the beautiful face sometimes he had to climb up into trees to look at it in the sunrise the woods were so filled with the voices of his pursuers but neither hunger nor poverty nor small ferocious enemies were able to take from him the beautiful face it never left his heart all night long and all the watching day it was pressed close to his side meanwhile the princess was in despair more and more the fancy possessed her that with the lost mirror her beauty too was lost in her unhappiness like all sad people she took strange ways of escape she consulted the stars the empirics from the four winds settled down upon her castle each of course had its own invaluable nostrum and all went their way for not one of these understood the heart of a poet however 
at last there came to the aid of the princess a reverend old man of ninety years a famous seer deeply and gently and pitifully learned in the hearts of men his was that wisdom which comes of great goodness he understood the princess and he understood the minstrel for having lived so long alone with the infinite he understood the finite to him the princess was as a little child and his old wise heart went out to her and as i have said his heart understood the minstrel too therefore he said to the princess i know the hearts of poets in seven days i will bring you back your mirror and the old man went and at length found the poet eating wild berries in the middle of the wood that is a beautiful mirror you have by your side said the old man this mirror answered the poet holds in its deeps the most beautiful face in the world it is true said the wise old man i have seen the beautiful face but i too possess a mirror will you look into it and the poet took the mirror from the old man and looked and as he looked the mirror of the princess fell neglected in the grass why said the wise old man do you let fall the princess's mirror but the poet made no answer for his eyes were lost in the strange mirror which the wise old man had brought him what do you see in the mirror said the old man that you gaze so earnestly in it i see answered the minstrel the infinite miracle of the universe i see the august and lonely elements i see the solitary stars and the untiring sea i see the everlasting hills and as a crocus raises its rainbow head from the black earth in springtime i see the young moon growing like a slender flower out of the mountains yet look again said the old man into this other mirror the mirror of the princess look again and the poet looked taking the two mirrors in his hands and looking from one to the other at last he said gazing into the face he had fought so long to keep at last i understand that this is but a fleeting phantom of beauty a fluttering flower of a face just one beautiful flower in the innumerable meadows of the infinite but here and he turned to the other mirror here is the eternal beauty the divine harmony the sacred and fathomable all would a man be content with one rose when all the roses of all the rose gardens of the world were his you mean said the wise old man smiling to himself that i may take the mirror back to the princess are you really willing to exchange her face for the face of the sky i am answered the minstrel i knew you were a poet said the sage and i know that you are very wise answered the minstrel yet after all the princess was not so happy to have her mirror back again as she had expected to be for had not a wandering poet found something more beautiful than her face end of section 11